I work in an organization called Liberation Technology. We made it short. We call it Lib Tech India. And I'm based in Jharkhand, but I also work in other parts of the country, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh. Um, and Lib at Lib Tech, what we do is uh, a lot of action research work where we try to work on social security programs at the grassroots levels with partner organizations, activists, uh, local groups who've been there, been working on social security programs for years. And we try to support them in trying to see how these uh, schemes can be delivered more effectively, how there can be more transparency of information and more accountability at local levels. Uh, we also work with national campaigns, state governments, um, to try to see how accountability can be, you know, how governments can be accountable through and through for delivering these public services more effectively. And a lot of our work has to do in the uh, domain of uh, how technology can be harnessed and used to actually um, do, do this work. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about not so much data, but a little bit of the tech infrastructure behind all these government programs that are incre increasingly <coughs> planned, monitored, and even implemented through, you know, digital means. And there's a craze of digitization in the country. Um, and what happens when these things, uh, when citizens interact with technology, what happens and sometimes legal rights of people are infringed upon because of this interaction. Um, so what happens in this scenario? What are the questions we can ask? Um, this picture is from Jharkhand in a post office in a city. And it's so common over there for the link to fail when the biometric doesn't work that they actually made a board called link fail and they just put it up every time it doesn't work so that people can just look at it and go away. And they don't have to come and ask that I want to withdraw my money. Um, so this is essentially the summary of my talk, link fail. Um, I'll start a little bit with the rights enshrined in the Indian constitution. Um, constitution guarantees right to life, right to equality, right against exploitation and constitutional remedies. And these are some of the rights that are relevant to today's topic. These are all the fundamental rights. Um, so I've listed them out here. Um, along with these rights in the Indian constitution, there have been the directive principles of state policy, which uh, which are essentially the values that the state must follow and imbibe in order to enact these rights and these laws. And in the past, uh, say, decade, over a decade or so, say, 20th century, there have been a lot of laws that have, uh, laws that have been implemented to realize some of these rights. So, for instance, um, one of the directive principles says that the state shall within the limits of its economic capacity and development make effective provisioning for securing the right to work, to education, and to public assistance in cases of unemployment. Um, and some of these, this one particularly, along with the right to life, uh, has been realized in a program called the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which Rajesh spoke about a little while ago. Um, and I'll come to that a bit later, but some of these are recent rights based registration, legislations. Uh, the right to information the right to education, NREG, as I mentioned, National Food Security Act, which came from the right to food. There was a very famous case in the Supreme Court, the right to food case, and post that, over time, the midday meal scheme, uh, the rations, etc. I mean, these things have existed in the past, but this has become a sort of justiciable right for people. Um, if they don't get it, they can actually go to court and say that my rights have been infringed upon. Um, and like I mentioned that, most of these programs now are being planned, implemented, and monitored digitally. So what happens when rights and uh, digitization actually interact? Um, now, in such a scenario, we have some questions to think about and consider. Because technology systems don't exist in a silo. Um, they're also very political systems and imbibe, uh, and they have to imbibe the right values uh, to make democratic participation more meaningful. 
what happens when tech systems subvert legal rights of people who is accountable if a computer is not working or a link is failing who is accountable how does how do these tech designs incorporate democratic values and if they do or don't um, is it inclusive or does it exacerbate existing power structures in society um and mostly i am of the view that tech can either enhance participatory democracy nor reduce socio economic inequalities in itself it can be an enabler it can help uh, but in itself it's not a solution for any of these larger questions um now coming back so i'm going to talk about some examples from my field experience and a little bit of excerpts from perhaps some books that are useful um the first bunch of examples have to do with uh, the national rural employment guarantee act very briefly it's a fruition of the right to life and right to work the narega and it it provides up to 100 days of work uh, in a given year to a rural household at demand so a household can go to a local government body and say okay i'm in need of work and they would be given manual labor work to be uh, done on completion of the work they would be paid minimum wages um and right from when a worker goes to make that work demand to the time the work is done uh, there's a gps mapping that happens uh when when the work demand happens there's a muster roll like an attendance sheet that's that there and only if your name is on that which is a auto generated thing if your name is on that then you get to work once you work it's recorded there's some gps mapping and then once that stage of completion of work is done then one uh, lot of payment goes out to the worker for having completed the work and the entire payment system is also very digitized a lot of work that i have done over the last few years has been on these payment systems um so once the worker has completed the work the entry for the attendance is done that okay so and so worker has worked on this work site for these many number of days and they have to uh, that payment is then that fund transfer order what it's called an fto is generated and they have uh, they get the payment directly into their bank account from the central government so all of this process um is to be completed on a real time management information system so as it happens the entry has to subsequently happen within 2 days 5 days and it has three essential safeguards the act which are built in in the act the first one is of the unemployment allowance so if you don't get work because it's a guarantee it's a right you get an unemployment allowance the state is unable to provide you a job or any labor work you you are automatically entitled to get an unemployment allowance the second is delay compensation so if you've done the work but your payment gets delayed there is a clause to complete the payment within 15 and the third sort of safeguard is the safeguard of a social audit where the community can participate and audit uh, what work has happened how much fund has been allocated who has been paid who has not been paid so there is some sort of local social accountability that is built in within the act so it's a very progressive act in that sense now like i mentioned the, everything is tracked and recorded on this management information system um which is again one of it's a feather in the cap of uh, you know for transparency in the country because it's the first time this level and this amount of information has been put out in the public domain uh by any government uh, department now the management information system um as the name goes has been designed for the for administrative purposes so it has been there for them to manage the scheme not so much for transparency although one can get a whole lot of information on this mis which is essentially a website that any any of you can also track um one thing that i wanted to sort of highlight here about the management information system is that information is layered it involves production uh, presentation access and use citizens and workers are actually participating definitely in the production of information but not in any of the other steps very limited in in access also if you think of a rural citizen trying to access this website uh it's very cumbersome it's very complex 
um, very difficult to actually find out what piece of information is where and a lot of times it's only in English so it's also very difficult for people to access. Even if it is in a local language, it's just a plethora of information put in hundreds of different reports. Uh, so essentially a worker whose information it is in the first place isn't really able to make sense of this whole website. Um, and at this point, I sort of wanted to get in the concepts of this knowledge gap hypothesis and the digital divide. Um, the knowledge gap hypothesis basically says that people belonging to a higher socioeconomic group digest new information faster than weaker sections in society and therefore exacerbating uh, the power structures and hindering their democratic participation. The way the MIS is currently designed does exactly that. It creates this digital divide between people who have access to this website, who understand it, and those who can't. Uh, particularly those who can't are the ones whose information is out there on the website. Sorry, you have a question? So the government says that it's it's for transparency purposes and it's proactive disclosure of information. So it could essentially be anybody. I think tacitly it's the administration because the administration has to access the MIS for every step of the process. They have other reports like where the payments are, like what's happened to the payment, etc. But it's it's in 10 other different kinds of reports. So if you want to piece together one person's work life cycle, you will actually have to go through a lot of different reports. And Rajesh must have some experience in, you know, going through this whole website. As a group collectively also, a lot of, there's no data dictionary first of all. So it takes a lot of time to process what a particular thing means. It's actually how we learned it is, you know, go on the field, do trial and error, see, okay, this date is, oh, okay, this is the date that's saying uh, payment date. But payment date is actually nothing really. Um, on the field, when you go and see, neither has the payment been generated on that date, nor has the payment been made on that date. So then you have to kind of do a little bit of back and forth and make sense of what's on the website and it's completely out of the, you know, uh, a worker can't access it and understand it for sure in in most places. Yeah. There are multifold divides. There's a divide between the administration and the workers. There's a divide between the workers like computer operators on, on the field who are able to understand and piece together this information and people who have worked who don't understand this information. So there's a divide being created within a local system as well. Uh, there are some people of the community who will have more access to internet facilities, etc. who will be able to look at this information and make more sense of it. Um, and those who are vulnerable would probably be left out in the way that this website is currently designed which is one of the things. I'll elaborate a little bit more with some examples so it'll get clearer. One, so other than the MIS, I think a lot of the designers of technology are very privileged people, a lot of times bureaucrats. And Rajesh, I think he put it really well in the beginning when he said that it's one, if you introduce one new technological intervention, it's one more promotion for you. So a lot of times, uh, there's this craze that if we, you know, we bring in some cool tech, uh, it'll, it'll make the whole scheme really fancy and they're not always thinking about who it's being designed for. It's one platform for everyone to use, for you and me as researchers to use, for workers to use, for administration to use, it's all one thing. So there's not that much thought being going into the design. Um, and Ultimately, what's happened is that this computer has become an ally to pass on the baton of accountability. A very simple example is that when the fund transfer order is generated at the state level, uh, the com state computer operator or the block development officer or the program officer, whosoever is responsible, says we've done our job. Now we don't know where your payment is. But that's not where the accountability should end. Till the time I don't get my money in my hand, you should be accountable. The state should be accountable till the time I have received my payment in my hand. But now it's just like 
the computers i've entered it on the computer now i don't know what it is and a lot of times they really don't know where it is what what's happened to it so two particular cases of subversions of rights uh, in narega i'm going to discuss one is uh, delays on the part of the central government now as i mentioned that what happens is that a fund transfer order is generated at the block level and then it's just a digital message that goes to uh, the central government and the central government releases the fund and sends it into the workers bank account directly there's no there's no other middle intermediary in this whole thing um, and this centralization of you know fund transfers essentially started happening uh, in 2000 say 13 14 and by 15 almost all payments had been centralized um so that's the stage one where i enter all your details post you've done your work at the grassroots level at the block level and that's stage one of the payment stage two is the time it takes for the transfer to happen from the center to the workers account now mis very uh, slyly only calculates the stage one part of the delay so it only checks the local level person's accountability did i get the master roll on time did i do the entry on time and did i generate the order that's it the stage 2 part of the payment is just not calculated and even if it is calculated now it is being calculated but it's not being shown in the public domain now why is that happening because delay compensation is uh, to be paid on in the act so the government doesn't want to pay that extra part they, they are aware that delays are happening and massive delays are happening and that if they start paying delay compensation uh, they incur a lot of cost so they just hit the stage one Uh, stage two part and said for stage one we'll pay delay compensation. That too, state has to pay the delay compensation. Center has no accountability in this at all. And then when we did a study, thanks to this MIS, we actually had access to about you know all, all the transactions, and we did a study of about nine million transactions in ten states in the country, and we found on an average that in just the stage two, the center to the worker uh, payment, there are fifty days of delays. when the payment is actually supposed to happen within 15 days the stage 2 is taking 50 days and the center is not being accountable for any of these delays and therefore not even calculating or paying the compensation uh one of the things we did is take this to the supreme court and say that this is a violation of this right and then the supreme court passed very strict orders still the center is not they're calculating stage 2 but they're not paying compensation for stage 2 so that's another battle to fight um so that's the delay compensation part where you know the right to get your wage on time uh is violated the second one is rejected payments in so suppose i'm trying to make a payment to you and the transaction fails that's essentially what a rejected payment is but if i'm trying to make a payment to you and the payment fails i'll try and figure out why it's failed and then correct that issue and then regenerate the payment in india these payments have been getting rejected ever since these online bank transfers have happened and nobody has figured what to do they they merely regenerate the payment without correcting the problem so the payment gets rejected again and this is endemic to most parts of the country but some states are completely leading the way like rajasthan 13% of all of india's payments that are rejected are from rajasthan um and one in 20 uh, payments gets rejected like transaction gets rejected so while um a lot of times i get the argument that this is not a very significant number it's just one in 20 but for that one person it's it's the end of it so i'm going to talk about kanku devi of rajasthan now kanku devi is somebody i met uh, some months ago when i was in rajasthan and then i've been meeting similar people in jharkhand rajasthan several other parts of the country uh now whose payments have been rejected kanku devi had done work earlier this year for about 10000 rupees worth of wages she should have got and the last date by when she should have got the wages were in may so she did work from earlier this year and from may up to now she hasn't received her wage because it's rejected now on the online system uh, so when i met her i had her name from the online system so it was easy for me to locate her and when i met her i asked her what has happened to your payment she was clueless 
she said i went everywhere i went to my panchayat they said uh, go to the block we don't know i went to the block they said go to the bank we don't know i went to the bank the bank simply said that your payment hasn't come and she's done this several several times and spent a lot of money in doing this and going through this entire process and she has no clue what's happened she just said i've done this work this is the money due to me and i haven't been paid and nobody is answerable to me so when she went to the block the block computer operator told her that i've done my job my job was to do the computer entry i don't know why it's rejected i don't know what he doesn't even know it's rejected um finally uh kanku devi decided that this is not working for me i've done so much work i've put in so many days of my work and i haven't been paid so she decided to drop out of the program so she's not doing any more narega work now and both these reasons delay compensation and rejected payment they they cause you harassment at that at the time you have to spend money a lot of people a uh, lot of middlemen come and say that you know we'll help you get the money give us this much give us that much and also cheat people in that way and ultimately nothing really happens then therefore a lot of people have dropped out of narega in the last few years there has been a trend of seeing that scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in the country their participation in narega has significantly reduced now this is going to hit the most vulnerable the most like kanku devi she is a single lady um she's this is the only way that she was earning at the time and she does other manual labor work in the village so it's going to hit the people who are most vulnerable the hardest now there's had this delay compensation and rejected payments these are more related to the digital payment infrastructure that has come about since 2014 and there has been this huge overhaul in the payment system itself where the government has wanted to migrate to aadhar based payments uh it's very unclear why they wanted to do it um every time one asks the government why you wanted to migrate from a already decently working payment system to an aadhar based payment system they kept coming up with different reasons even earlier payments used to happen to individual bank accounts so there was no question of my money going into somebody else's bank account because the names were matched but for variety of reasons uh, the aadhar based payment systems were introduced and we did a study so we wanted to find out so we got the workers perspective that they are really suffering and they are fairly clueless about it so we wanted to check with the banks so we did a study in jharkhand uh, last december and went to about 13 different banks to ask them what is it um, that you understand in this payment infrastructure and if somebody comes up to you saying where is my payment what is it that you do and they too were really clueless they didn't even know a whole lot of things that were already available on their software so we interacted with senior bankers and people who design the software we learned some things from them and then we went on the ground to check if the people actually knew it they actually didn't know a whole lot of it in fact simple things like consent forms to link your aadhar when we asked them that do you have a consent form they would search online consent form and then you know say okay this is this is what we have so they didn't even have a consent form with them let alone and they're not to blame in a sense because rural bank branches like this one here in rajasthan on any given day has like hundreds of people and at most 3 4 5 staff members so it's very difficult for them to keep up with the footfall so if you're going to sit and try to figure out why somebody's payment has been rejected you're probably going to spend a couple of days doing it you don't have that bandwidth in a rural bank branch um the other thing is that a lot of bankers express that the technological changes are too rapid for them to cope a lot of bankers especially in the state owned banks are people who have been working for years and years who are not so savvy with technology and even those who are savvy with technology said it's the tech changes were too fast for them to cope up with particularly in these aadhar related payments now another thing i wanted to highlight about aadhar related payments was that when the system was rolled out it wasn't ready it wasn't fully developed and they hadn't um they hadn't checked for what could go wrong in that system 
they just rolled it out in a con in the whole country with a lot of pressure on these banks that you have to link every account to Aadhaar, uh, and you have to transfer all these payments via Aadhaar now. That made so the government had to do a lot of back and forth. Suddenly, in between, then they said, "Okay, now too many mistakes have happened because we just link people's Aadhaar without checking whether we're linking the correct person's Aadhaar with the correct person's bank account." Um, ISB had done another study in Jharkhand which said about 38 percent. I think it's a bit of an overestimate, but 38 percent of payments went to the wrong person's account because of Aadhaar-related issues. Um, and one of the bankers told us that the government has created this huge mess by introducing an unt untested system very coercively. So now the government wants to clean up the mess. But instead of that, if they had checked and tested the technology properly and then rolled it out, things would have been perhaps better. I still have no, um, no proper answer from anybody why the Aadhaar based payment system was introduced uh, in, in the entire country, including the people who designed it. Um, so one, sorry, I went to the head. One possible way to sort of circumvent this that we, we were thinking about is that before you in, uh, you know, introduce this kind of an overhaul in a technological system. Obviously, test it out and see where it works. But even testing will be limited. It, there will be cases where it won't work for sure. There will be people who will fall through the cracks. So there has to be an alternative system for them. They can't be only Aadhaar based payments or only MIS based registration of work. There has to be an alternate system for people to fall back on when things don't work. The other a uh, very big missing thing that we found in our work is that there are no grievance redressal systems. So for Kanku Devi, there was just no way there was the traditional system like filing a letter to the block, etc. But that also takes a lot from a rural woman to go and talk to a block officer and say, Mera darj kijiye. also takes a lot, a uh, lot of courage from her end. So a good grievance redressal system, if that was in place and if she could have accessed that, maybe at her panchayat level, um, that would have perhaps eased a little bit of the pain. Here she has no grievance redressal system, neither does she have, you know, any alternative way to get her payment. Um, and this quote uh, by Kintaro Toyama, is something that I find is very relevant to quote at this point. It's not that technocratic ideas in general are bad and in and in of themselves. Rather, the trouble is cultism and imbalance. New vaccines are good, but not while healthcare systems go unfunded. Educational technology might be helpful, but not if good teachers and institutional support are lacking. Elections are great, but not if social norms and government institutions don't support democracy. Technocratic means might be a part of the solution, but with so much attention on them, who's working on the other parts? So, even in this case, um, I'm not saying throw all technology out, but what values is that technology imbibing and who is it being designed for and who is designing it is, is very, very important to ask. Um, another very similar uh, sort of thing is Abhay Bang, uh, he runs this organization called Search in Gachiroli and he's written a lovely piece called Research by the People, of the People and for the People. Um, do try to read it if you get a chance. He's, he talks about research and I have a similar view of technology also that he says that research should be done in consultation with the people you want to research. Um, and their participation in that research is very important for it to be successful. Similarly, I think for tech also, uh, technology should be designed uh, and thought of along with the people who it's being designed for. So one, you have to be very clear if you're doing an MIS for an administrative system, uh, be clear that this is for administrative purposes and this is not for citizens. The other is that when you do uh, want to do proactive disclosure of information or design tech for people, 
then their participation in that um, I think is very critical. Um, a lot of, so two examples, like Kanku Devi's examples are very uh, hard hitting examples, but a lot of these cases in Manrega actually violate uh, a bunch of democratic values of people and a lot of them then drop out of the whole workforce, which indirectly then affects their right to life and right to work. Um, the second thing I wanted to highlight here is that there's so much, even in the government systems, when we approach them with problems, there's so much reliance on government data that if it's in the computer, it must be correct. And if it's in the computer, it must exist. If it's not in the computer, it doesn't exist at all. But that data itself lacks a lot of credibility, like the stage one and stage two payment. What it shows you online is that the payment is done. But in reality, the payment is not done. So the data itself lacks credibility. And I think one has to constantly question um, the veracity of data that we also analyze secondary data too, and constantly engage with people to see if this data is actually true, credible or not. Um, more uh, sort of uh, harsher costs of digital tech solutions have been cases of starvation deaths in Jharkhand that have been linked to Aadhaar failures. Uh, I'm not delving too much into it. Uh, there are also other related failures when biometrics fail and people didn't get access to their rations. And as a consequence of that, a lot of people, um, they starve. And there were a series of deaths that have been happening for the last two years, at least being recorded for the last two years in Jharkhand because of these failures. Um, and others, another quote that I borrowed that I found would be useful here that we can build or architect code um, or code cyberspace to protect values that we believe are fundamental, or we can build or architect or code cyberspace to allow those values to disappear. There is no middle ground. Code is never found. It is only ever made and only ever made by us. So again, to say that, um, you know, once you've implemented a technological solution, everything's going to be fine um, is a bit of, uh, needs a little bit more nuance to that. Because behind all these codes are people who are thinking, sitting and writing these things. And it's very important what their politics are, what the politics of the people who are designing these systems is. Um, one, Slightly more positive example of how technology has been used is uh, the grievance redressal system in Narega, Narega grievance redressal system in Telangana. So they could call into a call center number, workers could call into a call center number and register their grievance uh, on, on the toll free number. And only the essential details were sought from the person. So everything else was auto populated. So the worker didn't have to really give all the details of everything. She just had to provide say her job card number, her name, etc. And the rest of the details would be populated on its own. So it became very easy for people who are filing the grievance to file it. And even the people who are calling in, they didn't have to furnish too much information. It also became much easier for the administration to work on those grievances because they had a lot of information already pre-populated that was being collected by on the MIS. And then they would give the worker a code and they, that would send a text message. Of course, one can argue that this is uh, available to people only who have cell phones and can access phones, but still uh, better than you know not having it at all. Uh, that that code you could track your complaint and you could call back and say this is my complaint code and you know as our popular customer service uh, things work, they had a similar grievance redressal system there, and that actually was one of the well, like it worked well, it was a good working project in Andhra, erstwhile, erstwhile Andhra. Um, and about 5 lakh workers' payments um, were made, or grievances rather were resolved um, using that system. Now, the second part um, of my presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about centralization of design. Um, it's First of all, it's violative of the federal structure of, you know, our country. When all systems are designed by 
NIC at Delhi with very little leeway for states to actually, you know, change these systems on, on the ground. Um, it violates the very nature. Um, even in Narega, a lot of these centralized design systems don't allow states to bring in certain uh, changes that they want. Like some states want to actually pay higher wages. So they have to go through the center every single time they want to change something and then tell the center, okay, these are the changes we need now, please change them and then go through that entire process. Uh, whereas they could have done it, if the state were allowed to do it, then they could have been more context specific. Um, one example there I wanted to give is from the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, which is the maternity benefit scheme under the National Food Security Act. Under this scheme, it's basically a conditional cash transfer for pregnant and nursing women. And you get a sum of 5,000 rupees in three installments. If you're pregnant, you, you get the first installment during, first two installments during your pregnancy and the third one after your childbirth if you meet a, meet a certain number of conditions. Now, meeting the conditions is not a problem because it's just like registration of your, you know, pregnancy and things like that, which people generally meet. But in Jharkhand, Again, this is something that we, this is what we found through an RTI, but we've also done a study recently, like this summer, and uh, our results were similar. Merely 14% of women got all three installments. So, and these are all the eligible women who have applied. I'm not even talking about those who haven't applied. Now, why is that the rest of them didn't get um, these things? A lot of uh, these women were put in something called the correction queue, where there was some problem with their form. And uh, they were put in this correction queue. Now, this entire system is an online system. So, once I apply, it has to be entered into an online portal, which is a central portal, which is the same for all the states in the country. And once it's entered there, that's that's the that's the proof that you have applied. If all details there are found to be correct, only then your payment gets processed. When details don't match, they're put into a correction queue. Or there's some kind of a flag that's there within your application, you're put into a correction queue. You have to correct whatever is wrong with your application and then reapply. One of the most common issues in Jharkhand was this case of Kumari and Devi. So before the woman is married, uh, her name is so-and-so Kumari. After the marriage, the name changes to so-and-so Devi. Now, most people have their Aadhaar cards in their earlier names, Kumari names. But when they get married, they open bank accounts in their new, uh, you know, where they are married, the husband's village. And in the, uh, the, in the bank account, the name is Devi. So, the payments weren't going through. I mean, the form was not even getting accepted because of this Kumari Devi problem. And most of the people we met had this Kumari and Devi issue. Uh, so we told, we went up to the government and said, this is something very trivial, you can correct it. You don't have to have Devi and Kumari matching. If you can introduce something within your code that sort of accepts it, they said, no, it's designed by the center. We can't do anything about it. So uh, if software is designed centrally, the state can't accommodate these context-specific issues. This is just one example. But a lot of other similar examples from other schemes also show that if the state, there are state specific nuances and if the state is allowed to do these kind of, you know, changes, develop their own technology, perhaps these things would not occur. Um, and the third sort of important thing that I wanted to address is about the neutrality of technology. Uh, Melvin Kranzberg, um, evolved these series of truisms, which are actually called Kranzberg's laws. I've just picked two of them. Uh, the first one is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And behind every machine, I see a face, indeed many faces. The function of technology is its use by human beings. And sometimes, alas, it's abuse and misuse. So just going back uh, to what I was saying earlier, that tech, is not neutral in itself. In fact, it's it's quite the opposite. It's quite political. Um, there is another fantastic book uh, called The Weapons of Mass Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Did you uh, talk about? Okay, I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. Um, 
but it's such a brilliantly written book um and i'm going to just read out one excerpt about this technology called pred paul um which was designed to detect crime in some parts of america and what ended up happening is that a software that was being used to which was absolutely neutral right like according to its um designers it ended up being biased towards black and hispanics and i'll just read out uh, an excerpt from there which will make more sense of what i'm saying uh police chief william haim had to figure out how to get the same or better policing out of a smaller force so in 2013 he invested in a crime prediction software made by predpol a big data startup based in santa cruz california the program processed historical crime data and calculated r by r where crimes were most likely to occur the reading policeman the policeman of that area that region was called reading the reading policeman could view the program's conclusions as a series of squares each one just the size of two football fields if they spent more time patrolling these squares there was a good chance that they would discourage crime <coughs> and sure enough a year later chief haim announced that burglaries went down by 23% jeffrey brantingham the ucla anthropology professor who founded predpol stressed to me that the model is blind to race and ethnicity the key inputs are the type and the location of each crime and when it occurred that seems fair enough and if the cops spend more time in high risk zones foiling burglars and car thieves there is a good reason to believe that the community benefits but most crimes aren't serious as burglary and grand theft auto and that is where the serious problem emerges when the police set up their red pole system they have a choice they can focus exclusively on the so called part one crimes these are violent crimes including homicide arson assault which are usually reported to them but they can also broaden the focus and include part 2 crimes including aggressive panhandling and selling and consuming small quantities of drugs many of these nuisance crimes would go unrecorded if the cop weren't there to see them these nuisance crimes are endemic to many impoverished neighborhoods in some places police call them anti social behavior or asp unfortunately including them in the model threatens to skew the analysis once the nuisance data flows into the predictive model more police are drawn into those neighborhoods where they are more likely to arrest people where they are likely to arrest more people after all even if their objective is to stop burglaries murders and rape they are bound to have slow periods it's the nature of patrolling and if a patrolling cop sees a couple of kids who look no older than 16 guzzling from a bottle in a brown bag he stops them these types of low level crimes populate their models with more and more dots and more and models send cops back to the same neighborhood this creates a pernicious feedback loop the policing itself spawns new data which justifies more policing and our prisons fill up with hundreds and thousands of people found guilty of victimless crimes most of them come from impoverished neighborhoods and most are black or hispanic so even if the model is color blind the result of it is anything but in our largely segregated cities geography is a highly effective proxy for race so predpol essentially uh, was supposed to be neutral the technology to race and ethnicity but ended up being um, biased towards the black and hispanics now one counter example that i wanted to give from some of the work we're doing in andhra pradesh right now is um say use machine learning to preempt exclusions so we've got there's a whole lot of data available out there census data narega data maternity benefit data andhra pradesh does its own pulse survey so there's some data from there now all of this data we tried to put into a system and design we're still working on it trying to design uh, some kind of machine learning techniques to identify which families will be likely to be excluded or which people are likely to be more vulnerable and excluded from some of these programs using that data that's a counter example of how you can use tech to actually identify uh, vulnerable people uh, again tech even in this machine learning exercise we're very clear that tech won't solve the problem of exclusion and it won't replace current system of identifying exclusions like field based observation or community driven methods of saying you know so and so family is vulnerable they 
they need to receive this benefit. That's not going to replace any of those models, but this will just be an enabler, an addition to what is already there. Um, yeah, another positive example of how technology has been an enabler is the Jan Suchna portal of Rajasthan government. Um, this is the first time it's being done in the country. Basically, this is an online portal. Uh, I've tried to get a screenshot. It's got about 47 schemes across 23 departments. Uh, all the typical social security, health, etc. RTI is there. But key uh, land and mining records have also been proactively disclosed, including like who's got the mining license, uh, who's mining where, what are they mining, what quantities, what kind of projects are running. Those are things that have not been disclosed uh, in the past. The things that I wanted to highlight about the Jansushna portal is that every scheme that that's here, that's being displayed here, was actually the dashboard was designed with people and civil society organizations. So it was not some bureaucrat or techie sitting somewhere who just sat and designed it. They actually had a really long process um, spanning two different governments in Rajasthan that uh, came up with this uh, Jan Suchna portal where people said this is the information about mining that is useful to me or this is the information about rations that is useful to me and I want to see that. Of course, there are problems when sometimes you don't have the information, but that's another battle to fight altogether. When there was information in the public domain or sometimes even behind local logins, the Rajasthan government was able to get and publish this information proactively. Um, now, this is not only available on the web, but it's also available on this information booth, which is like an ATM that they are planning to put in every panchayat. Uh, of course, it's going to take time for this whole thing to work, for people to start using it. But there is an attempt to have this information out there to the people in a way that they understand it and what information that they want. Um, and there are young women from every panchayat who are trained to use this ATM-like machine. It's actually quite simple. You can just click on one of these schemes that you want and then it'll just, you can insert in your own number, your own ration card number, own job card number and find details about your own self or about your village as well. And information is available at different levels of disaggregation. But this was designed, as the name goes, it's for Jan Suchna. It's for people. It's for people to get information. So they were very clear right from the beginning that this is for people and we're going to find as many ways as we can to reach, uh, make this more meaningful for citizens to use. Um, this is what I meant by participatory planning and local inputs to tech design. Now the final part of uh, my presentation is uh, Unless it's it's in the computer, it's it's not true. And um, another example of how Aadhaar based and biometrics have created hassles for people. Um, this is actually a friend who I'm staying with right now in Bangalore, and I was talking to him about doing this presentation here, and he said, "You know what? This happened to my mother in the IT capital of the country. So forget." And his mom told me that I'm an 80 year old educated woman, and it's happened to me here. I can only you know, imagine and feel for the people that you're working with, that is going to be so difficult. So, uh, my friend's mom, her name is Lalita, and she she's an 80 year old woman who's supposed to get her pension. So she's supposed to get her pension, and she gets two different pensions in two different bank accounts. One is her family pension, and one is her employment, like her her own provident fund pension. So she had to prove every year she has to prove that she's alive so that the pension continues and she has to provide a life certificate. So in one bank, it was pretty straightforward. She had to get some form signed and all of that and that was done. The other one said, no, you have to do a biometric authentication. Now she's really old. Her fingerprints don't work well. Her biometrics kept failing. So they sent her from one center to another center saying, try there. She went there. She wasn't able to get a life certificate. The biometric just wouldn't work. So then they said, now we don't know what to do. So she went back to the bank. Now she's an 80 year old lady who's using a stick. And she has to climb up a center which has, you know, a really thin staircase. So she was telling me that I was petrified that I'm going to fall down and break, break something. And the pension amount that she was fighting for was only 1000 rupees. So it's not even like a really big amount. But irrespective of what the amount is, um, she said, I was, you know, I had to make all these trips. 
and normally something that would take me a day or so to get like a life certificate it took me 15 days and i finally had like finally got it with a lot of twist then they sent her to another place saying that you know this is not working you have to get it so uh, they said okay now go and change your aadhar card there's some problem with your biometrics in your aadhar so she went to the aadhar enrollment center paid 50 rupees got her aadhar biometrics updated changed again she went to the bank again it didn't work finally she just gave up and she said you know this isn't working and she she sort of went back to that officer and said so he said okay let's try an iris scan and uh, i'm not so sure how when where it worked but they got her iris scan and that thankfully matched and she was able to prove that she's alive so she was telling me very interestingly that you know i was there in flesh and blood but he wasn't ready to accept that i was alive until the time that biometric said that i'm alive so uh if this is happening in bangalore you can only imagine what's happening in the rest of the country and this over reliance of technology and that only technology is the right way to solve the problem is um, going to get us killed one day but i'll be less morbid um i'm just going to probably end with uh, this really nice uh, book uh, called the little prince it's somewhat of a children's book but i think it's very relevant for adults so i'm going to read a few lines from that book for us to ponder about a turkish astronomer discovered an asteroid on making this discovery the astronomer had present had presented it to the international astronomical congress in a great demonstration but he was in turkish costume so no one would believe what he said grown ups are like that fortunately however for the reputation of asteroid b612 a turkish dictator made a law that his subjects under pain of death should change to european costume so in 1920 the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again dressed with an impressive dressed with impressive style and elegance and this time everybody accepted his report if i have told you that these details about the astro if i have told you that these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you it is on account of the grown ups and their ways when you tell them that you have made a new friend they never ask you any questions about essential matters they never say to you what does his voice sound like what games does he love best does he collect butterflies indeed they demand how old is he how many brothers he has how much does he weigh how much money does his father make only from these figures do they think they have learned anything about him if you want to say to grown ups i saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick with geraniums in the windows and doves on the roof they would not be able to get an idea of the house at all you would have to say to them i saw a house that cost 20000 dollars then they would exclaim oh what a pretty house that is just so you might say to them the proof that the little prince existed is that he was charming that he laughed and that he was looking for a sheep if anybody wants a sheep that is proof that he exists thank you